Actually, I don't really draw that well. It's just that I don't stop trying as quickly. I keep at it. I happen to have high standards and I try to meet them. I have to struggle like hell to make a drawing look good. That's a wonderful quote from Milt Call, who was a Disney animator. And uh, Milt Call was also a huge inspiration to me as a kid. And even to this day, I love looking at his work and looking how he would interpret shapes and designs. And I think it's just a really great quote because it goes to show you his point of view in terms of just practicing and drawing and working hard. And that's a huge part of really developing your skill sets and becoming a better artist is just constantly drawing and going through the effort to get better. Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, this is Phil Dimitriotis. And um, what I decided to do is when I initially set out with my YouTube channels, I was just uploading some lectures and um, for students and for being a teacher while working in the industry. And now I've become a full-time college teacher. And um, it, it sort of hit me about not just doing lectures, but I wanted to show more process on how I work. And I was talking to a couple students and uh, some, some uh, friends and decided that maybe it would be a good idea if I started to record myself when I'm drawing and working. That way I can share with you guys part of my process. And most importantly, something that I take for granted quite a bit, which is I come from a traditional background and I really do enjoy drawing traditionally. And as the digital age is upon us and people are working with iPads and Cintiqs, I think there's a huge part of traditional sketching and design that's being lost from using just a simple sketchbook and just carrying around some good paper with you. So, you know, that's why I thought I'd put this demo together as a sample of me just sitting around having fun. And I sort of take for granted, I have pages of these things and I just sit and go out and, you know, have a cup of coffee and sketch. And what I really need to be doing is just sitting here at home, turning on the recorder. And then that way I can share with those of you that have joined us on YouTube a couple basics about about designing and sketching. So um, what I'm doing here is I'm coming up with I'm drawing on a tone paper and I'm using a Prismacolor Indigo Blue pencil. It's a fantastic pencil. Um, it's um, I discovered the pencil when I was working inside the animation industry for environments from a couple different artists and um, from Michael Spooner, Paul Felix, another guy named Jim Schlenker. And ever since I discovered this way back in like 1990, I think it was 95, it's been a pencil that I just love to use. Oh, and Robert St. Pierre. And it's a pencil I really love to use. It's great for sketching. It just has a wonderful feel. It's like a wax pencil, um, excuse me, wax with pigment. And so it has a tendency to glide on a smooth surface very nicely. Okay. So um, what I'm doing right here is I'm gonna do some alligator studies and I wanna show you part of the process and how I like to work sometimes. Um, I just like to take shapes and start with a base shape and see where it leads me. So you can see the three I've already done. Um, usually I just go for a wide shape. I might squash and stretch and go for a pointy shape. Here on this guy, I sort of had an idea of what I wanted with the eyes. Um, so usually I don't do the eyes right, right away. Usually I go for the shape itself, but I just thought, you know, what happens is when I do sketches like these and get into what I call the, the drawing mode, the drawing mode is where I'm sort of not disturbed, listening to good music. I don't have any distractions. I can really just sort of take off and whatever I feel coming out of my brain and in my hand just sort of happens. And it just gives me different ideas and it allows me to explore and go through this process. So. I thought it would be cool from now on. I'm going to start doing a whole bunch of demos and trying to convey more about traditional media techniques because for numerous reasons, it is a huge, huge importance to doing anything digital. If you understand how something works in a traditional format, then you're going to be 10 times more successful when you start bringing it over into a digital format. And there really is something to say about that, about under sketching, about pre sketching, about feeling the weight of the pencil, knowing when to push down and pull up on it. And it's a really, really huge part of, of knowing how to draw well. Um, on this sketch here, look at how I started with the head ball. I threw in the eyes real quick. I did speed this up by about 40% just to keep the demo at about 35, 40 minutes to keep it out of that hour range. Um, 
So it's just a teeny bit sped up, it's not too bad. And then what I did is I threw the jaw in here. With the alligator, one of the key attributes to them is having the upper jaw and the lower jaw. And um, I really wanted to try to push that flexibility of rotating between either an underbite or an overbite on some of these alligator sketches. Okay. Um, also, I wanted to mention my mic here at home sort of died on me earlier today. And I had to uh, I had to order a new USB adapter for it. So I'm using the internal mic. It's built in to the Logitech Pro Cam. It's not too bad. It's a little air soundy. And and by the way, on the last demo, one of the last demos I put up, I did catch there was an option on Camtasia where uh, the the background mic, uh, excuse me, the background speakers were on, creating that buzzing sound. I was able to address that and fix that. So sorry for any uh, inconvenience there that happened before. So anyway, um, so I went back and I erased. That's my little kneaded eraser over there. And just a little side note, I do use only one kneaded eraser per color. I don't mix it. The reason why I don't, you can see how blue that is compared to the standard gray when they start, is um, for a couple reasons. Number one, is if you're drawing in different colors and you switch to a colored eraser, that color can come off on that paper, especially if you're in like a white paper or something else. Um, and number two, um, I use that exclusively for blue Prismacol, Indigo Blue, and also Cole Erase uh, sketching pencils. And it's just, I never pick up and smudge any other colors into my drawing. So I didn't like part of the sketch I had under there. And when I sketch sometimes, what I do is I'll notice that there's a shape I didn't push enough. Like here, I'm pulling out the chin a little bit more. Then I like to go back and I like to fix it and address it. So you'll notice sometimes when I'm working like this, I'm a little bit of a jumper. Like I jump to one drawing, I come back and forth. And that's just the way that I sort of rest to think about what I was doing. And it allows me to sort of develop parts of the drawing at one time. You know, that way I don't get too caught up into one aspect of the drawing. I could come back and then develop it as I go, okay? So look, I mean, they're just really, really, excuse me, I can't talk, really rough and loose. I said ruse, which is rough and loose put together, which I do all the time. They're really rough and loose sketches, just going for a simple shape. Um, there's really not any detail on here. I'm just putting in a little bit of the eyes, trying to figure out where the nose, maybe where the jaws might be interacting, because those are the key attributes on site a, uh, an alligator. Um, and once I have that shape down, then I could get in there and really start to push and pull and pull out some, some tone or some values. And one of the things I noticed, um, you know, working, I've, I've been teaching for numerous years. When I started working in the industry um, as an animation artist, I uh, was offered a couple jobs to teach on the weekends. And I would teach at a couple local colleges in California on Saturdays. And one of the things I've, I've always noticed since then is students love to go right for the detail. And it's like baking a cake, you know, you don't want to bake the cake. You don't want to have any form or structure and you just want to go put all the icing on the top. And you can't do that, that form and that structure. I mean, look at what I have here already on my page. That form and the structure aspect is holding together my character and it really brings them alive. And especially the other thing too, because I was just talking about this in uh, the basic drawing class that I teach, which is understand the shape and the form and the directional lines that are moving up and over the figure. So even with the way I'm sketching my characters right now, you can see these light little trace lines next to the head ball and on the sides of the character a little bit. That's me just really trying to remember how a line wraps over the shape and the form and how a jawline is working. And that it really is a huge part of properly developing a character because if you don't do that and your lines go cross contour in another direction that are not supporting the direction and the, and the move of the shape and the form, it, it's gonna feel lost and it flattens the drawing. And that right there is one of my biggest problems when students jump right into intense detailers and they're not really stopping to think about that. And they go back to rendering. And the problem is, is rendering really is a way to cover up mis mistakes in a drawing. And that's one thing that really bugs me that a lot of teachers don't talk about anymore is, um, especially in some basic drawing classes, 
you sit down and you render still life. And I'm like, ah, oh, to me, I, I get why they do that, but it's so boring sometimes to just render still life. And because you're immediately, any problems with perspective or the form are being covered up by the render itself. So, you know, try to, you know, I, I like the, my old teacher, Marshall Vandruff, would talk about um, making sure there's like a piece of yarn that can drop over the item that you're drawing. So it feels like there is a sense of a line wrapping around it and through it. And I think if you do that, even if it's just little things with like teeth, even if it's like the little goatee you saw me sketch on here, even thinking about where the back of, you know, this alligator's jaw goes up and then how does that connect to the back of the forehead? All these little elements come together to make a better drawing. And they're really just good old fashioned principles of drawing that start with, you know, sketching in a sketchbook and drawing all the time and staying busy. All right. Anyway, um, sorry, I wanted to, I know my hands covering this and unfortunately I can't get any way around that. I did think it would be really cool if I had like a plexiglass table and I could see underneath it, but then I'd be a little weird because then I'd be drawing sort of backwards. But anyway, let me just stop here. This is sort of where I'm at. I have some pretty good break-ins. I have a good feel for the movement and the character. I really like, remember I mentioned in the beginning, one of the things I was going for that I kept thinking about in the back of my head was this underbite and overbite change over in the jaw because every time I looked at alligator reference, that is something that's really big to me that I saw coming out. And then the thought of playing up the teeth too. So obviously you can already tell by most of these shapes, these aren't really, um, they're meant to be more menacing or sort of evil alligators because there's lots of pinching. The eyes are coming to like, they're like pinched off tear shapes and half circles. The teeth have points on them. So they're not really like your friendly alligator types. If I was going for the friendly type um, on another pass, actually I had more here. I would round off a couple more of my shapes and try to change a little bit of my, uh, my visual shape language inside my sketch to see what I come up with. So uh, this paper, in case you're looking for it, this tone paper, you can get it anywhere. This particular paper, here, let me shake it. It's very thick. So if you look for this, I actually got this from a company uh, called Kelly Paper and they make, it's called Sandstorm and it's just a nice thick cardstock. So some of you might not have a Kelly Paper around you and that's fine, but what you do have if you look at local printing presses, they make this paper called cardstock. And cardstock is a thick, heavy duty paper. And it's wonderful to draw on because it's a little bit thicker. And so be because of that, um, sorry, I'm thinking here and I flip a pencil whenever I'm thinking in my brain. It's trying to figure out how to solve a shape here. Anyway, back to the Kelly paper. If you go look for um, any type of cardstock in a different color, that's a great way to find a great paper. So, you know, you might be in Minnesota or somewhere in Argentina. And if you just look around at a couple local printing places, they're going to have what's called cardstock, which is a really thick, heavy stock of paper that's used for everything from advertisements to wedding announcements, you name it. And you could just call them up and say, Hey, I'd like to buy a ream which is 500 sheets of paper that averages anywhere from 20 to like 30 bucks. And then you have this really nice paper. Another place to get really cool toned paper like this is you can check out Strathmore. Um, I, I'm a big fan of Strathmore tone sketchbooks. Uh, I think they, they work really fantastic. The only thing I don't like, they're a little bit on the thinner side. And they're not as heavy as this cardstock. So this, this cardstock is just really thick and it allows you to really beat it up and you can erase into it. You can do markers into it. You can sketch, you can even do, you can draw like this with Prismacolor um, Indigo Blue. And then you could even come back on top of it with like a light water and just sort of smear it around just very lightly, not too much water because it's not a watercolor paper, but it'll really produce some cool sort of effects. Okay. So what I'm doing here is I'm just sort of pushing up a couple examples of thinking of how texture might flow over part of my alligators. Because when you look at alligators, they have a tremendous amount of texture on them. They have, you know, they have like, it's really cool because the texture goes from thick to thin. Um, they have circle textures, diagonal textures, square textures. It's a huge uh, arrangement of different variations. And 
that's something to me that's really wonderful I want to try to get into part of my sketch especially when I'm trying to create a little bit of contrast and push a sketch or two from each other you know and make a face look really neat so one of the things you guys aren't seeing here which I'll do another demo about and I'll display more of it with you is you're not seeing the seven or eight other pages of alligator sketches and crocodiles that I was working on. And there was a point in time when I got like really angry and mad. I was like sitting in my studio and just throwing paper balls behind me because I could not get it out. And that happened to me. And I know it happens to a lot of you guys too sometimes where, you know, it's almost like writer's block meets artist block. And that's, that's a common thing. But what finally happened, whenever I hit that phase, what I do is I go back and I start simple. And then I try to go through and I try to figure out um, what can I change and what can I modify and how do I adapt that. So um, to me, that's a huge part of my problem solving when I get to something like this is how do I go back in and then readjust what it is that I've been working on. And it's, it's a doable item. Um, you just have to start from more of a simple perspective and ground point. Sorry, the recorder's just recording and I always flip my pencil on my fingers when I'm trying to think of something that I'm working on. It's my little niche for uh, figuring out solutions or an idea to something. It's like a nervous tick. I'll spin my pencil. So what I did there, I changed pencils. One of the things I'm going to point out to you guys right now that are watching, you'll notice I have a couple different pencils. They're all the same. The difference is the tip. This one is a blunt tip. It's, it's really rounded and it doesn't have a point. And I really, just artist preference, I like roughing out and sketching with a really base blunt tip pencil. I think there's a certain feel to it that's quite wonderful. The other pencil on the left there, you'll notice, it has a little bit more of a tip, right? Um, and then sometimes I even have another pencil, I have a little tray above where I'm drawing here. And in that tray right here, I'll click on it. I have a nice, solid point pencil that allows me to get really fine detail like on the eyeballs or maybe a real distinctive cut inside a you know a nose or something that really allows me to push up so i'm never drawing with just one pencil to me that's sort of insane because sometimes i have the pencil on its side sometimes i have you know a blunt rounded tip i have a, a medium tip and then i have a sharp tip and i'm, I'm sort of rotating between all three trying to figure out what's working for me or what's not working okay um and what you saw right there that's my little hairbrush gotta have a hairbrush don't be swiping your hand over your drawing and smudging it and making a mess hairbrushes are fantastic they're simple they're easy and you know what they're like dirt cheap i mean you, you can get a real simple one they you know they range between seven to like 15 bucks depending on where you get them um I'll have to, in another demo here, I'm gonna show you guys the little one I just bought. I bought this little awesome Japanese one that's really, really cool. It's a portable one I take when I go out sketching at a coffee house. Anyway, so the other thing you notice up there on the top there, uh, above the kneaded eraser, that's a white polymer eraser. Um, and I love polymer erasers. On the back of my pencil here, I have a standard pink tip eraser they're okay they have a little bit of a rough feel to them sometimes they pull up uh pigment from a pencil on smooth paper pretty good you see me just erase there it pulls it up pretty fine um however though the white polymer are great because they're they're a little bit more they're softer and they don't dig as much into the paper so when you go to erase um it, it really just pulls up more of the pigment than it does destroying the paper and that's something that i find to be quite fascinating with with the way that they were so on this sketch here you know I, I didn't like the way the eyes were going on the top of the head so I came in here and I just sort of adjusted it real quick um, I like it a lot better I and I wanted a center line to go down sort of the center you see where the eyes are I wanted that center line to go down and feel like it could come up and wrap over the nostrils and it would make sense to, to how that character was sort of you know leaning in his direction and here I'm just going to put some, actually I was thinking this guy could be sort of dopey looking, but I just want to put some cool textures 
on him. Some thick and thin variations here. And um, that will help wrap a little bit of his shape there a little bit. Okay. I put some very light contour lines wrapping over the jaw here just to help wrap the jaw. And then a little bit of thick and thin contour line, you know. And you can see with the blunt pencil now, it's just, I don't know, it's just loose, it's light, it's so much fun. Love drawing with just a, um, a pencil like that. And I gotta give credit to who, to where I sort of learned some of that from. I learned it from two people. Number one is I learned it from Marshall Vandruff. Uh, Marshall, when I was younger, would sit and draw and he would pull out a woodless pencil, a solid lead, and it had a really blunt tip on it. He would sit and sketch these faces and uh, people and they look so amazing and I remember going gosh it looks so soft and there's not like a dedicated hard line and I realized I'm like he's using a woodless pencil with a blunt tip that's why that's why it looks so cool um and then also Glenn Vilpu a long time ago I got to take a class with him out here in uh, Hollywood and uh through the local 839 animation union and when I took that class um, he came over and he asked me if I was trained as an illustrator because I was drawing with a very fine tip pencil. He took my pencil and he broke off the tip of it and he gave it back to me and he said, now draw. Because losing your tip, you're not going to be as likely to do a whole bunch of detail. And then you're going to have to really sort of, you know, avoid all of that and just really get into the drawing and, um, you know, avoid the nitpicking this. So when I talk to you guys about detail, you know, and, and to students and all of you out there, I mean, the, the negative of it is that it's just the way you cover up a drawing that isn't working sometimes. And got to start with just shape and visual read and have something that's really working. So I'm trying to squeeze another little alligator here inside the negative space of this paper. And I think I could do it. It's a little tight, but I like doing that sometimes. I like having to squeeze and overlap characters together because it just creates a natural like uniformity and a natural sense of just overlap and flow together. And I just think it looks pretty cool, you know, it's just fun. Um, I am struggling a little bit on this one. I'm trying to figure out that hand's bugging me. It's like so close and I want to wrap the head ball shape of this alligator and get it to curve a little bit and figure out what's on it. And I'm also, when I was doing that, I wasn't liking the, the, the jaw tone. Someone was asking me about that. They said, Phil, are you still working in studios? And the answer is yes and no. And here's the answer to that question, which is, uh, I do I do freelance and I love to do freelance work. And what's cool about freelance means I don't have to drive into a studio. I could be at home and I could work on a weekend or I can work on a show. And I have a bunch of different just people that I know and people I've worked for in the past that I can work for. Um, but then on the other side is I've spent a lot of my time uh, working at Fullerton College and running the program. And I have two other awesome instructors, fellow colleagues I work with. And, you know, we're pretty busy, like writing grants, running computer labs, you know, making sure Cintiqs are up and running and, you know, having, you know, just guest speakers, this, that, and it's like you're doing a hundred other things sometimes. And then on top of that, you know, I take care of, uh, I've been taking care of, uh, you know, mom and dad. And then on top of that too, is, you know, being a dad and having, you know, kids and, and trying to do that. So life gets pretty busy sometimes. So, um, I was joking, talking to, uh, a friend of mine the other day and I made a comment about, he asked when I was going to go back to full-time work in the studio. And I made a comment and said, you know what? I can do, I get four months off over the summer. So um, I might just, you know, maybe the summer, next summer, might jump back in and do some more uh, studio work. Or sometimes freelance tends to be pretty busy. So I do a lot of freelance, you know, and that keeps you busy. So anyway, because um, I think it's, it's a relevant and it's a huge part as an artist staying in your industry and being current whether you're doing storyboards whether you're doing environment design background design character layout 
character design, whatever it is that you're doing, you're working on a production and you're having to work at a higher standard than it would be if you're just like drawing in your sketchbook or maybe on a project, you know, because part of that standard that you're setting forth is your reputation in working with others, which is a huge part, okay? So, uh, you notice sometimes I spin a pencil in my fingers. It's a habit I have, it's like a nervous tick. Whenever I'm drawing and I'm thinking, remember I was drawing this, listening to some good music on my headphones, and um, when I'm in that mode, that drawing mode, where I'm just totally in a rhythm, um, you'll, if I, if you ever see me stop and do that, sometimes I tap, whatever. It just means I'm trying to problem solve and think up another way to maybe run a line or a different shape, just to have something look a little different. So I know it looks a little funny when I'm sitting here and I'm voicing over my, my drawing I just did. When you're sketching, a lot of times I'm just trying to figure out the flow of a line or the eyes or, you know, a lot of times I'm also, when I'm in this mode here of drawing, I'm thinking about contrast. How do I get the eyes to pop against a certain tone or color? Or how do I get the eyebrows to maybe go in a different way and then have the eyes be set off to the side? And, you know, it's it, it, to me, it's part of that process of just building up a, a sketch and a drawing. And um, if some of you struggle with that right now as beginners, then that's just because you know, you need to spend a little bit more time drawing and sketching and you'll you'll find out what I'm talking about. You know, a great example of that is when you go out and you draw trees on organics. You know, you're, you're drawing one part of the tree and you gotta know when to stop and let the other side of the tree breathe and you have lost and found edges and you gotta find out when, you know, you don't over render something, you just sort of take it easy. And it's the same thing with even sketching characters is, you know, work on something find its, its, its details, its contrast, its pace, and then let it rest, let it fade off a little bit, you know, let it sort of all just come together. So let's, let me start another guy up here when he get, they had an idea here for the eyes and this, I gotta squeeze him in here, so I'm thinking this really long, like, bill, this, like, alligator just stretched out, upper, you know, overbite type of thing, and just gonna actually have to squeeze his shape into the paper. And in some weird way, you get a really better drawing out of that sometimes. You know, the, the shape comes together and it reads just a lot easier. And I'm gonna wrap this up as a rough sketch in just a couple minutes here. Then I'm gonna come back into this and I'm gonna put some highlights on. And I'm gonna show you guys how I push the other shapes a little bit by using the highlights. But I thought for today's demo, it'd be cool just to keep it in, you know, under a 40 minute window and just show you just, you know, sketching and having fun, working with simple shapes and, you know, just drawing, you know, just have fun with it. Don't, if you get stuck, it means you're going too complicated. Go back to something more simple, squash and stretch and pull and see where you end up. Okay, it, it's supposed to be, and I, it's supposed to be a fun process, not an arduous process. And usually students make it a difficult and arduous process because the subject matter they're drawing is too complicated and it's beyond their drawing expertise. And so go back and just have fun, you know? It's so great just to sit. I mean, um, so I realized I'm gonna try to I have, God, I have like three filled sketchbooks of characters and I never really show them to anybody. And you know what's funny is I don't even put them on Instagram. I know some of you are like, why don't you show them? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know why I don't. It's just something stupid. Maybe it's because I'm known as being like an environment guy and I do environments and I do storyboards and some rough storyboard cleanup. That's what most of my work is. But you know, I think the past, for me, like the past three years, I just been spending a lot more time sketching characters really been having a lot of fun with it so uh i think as the future comes up here i'm just going to continuously try to show more characters on youtube and just share more with my students about you know how much fun you can have and what i'd like to do is i'd also like to do a demo on sculpting a character in clay which would be really cool that's something else I enjoy and I'd like to, to pull together. So find a way to make a little bit more time. 
you could see me I was rocking out there in the background I was listening to some Metallica and just totally getting in the drawing mode and like cranking right there and that's what I really like to do and you know what that's why some of you guys don't realize like when you do a demo like this you put it up on YouTube it takes a lot of time I mean you have to do the recording you got to go out edit make sure there's no problems um, sometimes the camera can sc screw up you have a malfunction with something um, and, and then the mic will go crazy. You guys heard that buzzing sound in the last demo. And I'm like, what, where's that coming from? I have a, you know, I have like a $250 Yeti mic. Why is it making the buzzing sound? It shouldn't be doing that. And then I found out it was some little button you clicked on in the preferences where it was, you know, you could hear the other sound um, coming through. Anyway, almost wrapped up here. Anyway, this has been a lot of fun getting to sketch for you guys and just record it. And, um, you know, I didn't think about this in the beginning with Camtasia because I always thought I could just record the screen. And um, I didn't really think about why not hook up my cam and then have it face downward and I can draw my desk, right? So, uh, yeah, I'd like to do a lot more of these and I um, think it'll be a lot of fun to share some more importance uh, important aspects of drawing and sketching, which are, you know, I got to admit when I look at it, I'd say probably a good 70% of my own time sketching is done on traditional paper and uh, sketchbooks. And, um, you know, um, I, I like, you know, like the iPad and working that way too, but I just, God, I, there's something about the drag and the feel of pencil that I just don't want to get rid of, you know. I don't think I'll ever get rid of it. I'll always like to have it. And the thing is, this is a thing that's really cool to me, is that this sketch right here, this is an original. This is me, you know, this is me sketching. I There's only one of it on a piece of paper. I can't lose it digitally. Nothing can get modified. It's it's just cool to have that, you know. It's, it's your original that no one else has. And it's something that you made out of your own head. And to me, that's really cool, you know. So, anyway, um... I'm going to put a little bit of detail up on this guy. Get the eyes addressed in there a little bit. Punched out. A little bit more on the part of the face. You'll notice right there, I was rocking out to uh, a little bit of a Metallica in the background, but I had to pull that out. I'd like to just draw and record and leave the music in the back. The problem is, is you know, YouTube is so picky now. They have that algorithm software. That's why I've been trying to find some good royalty music. I did find a couple things on, on YouTube I can play in the background, but um, I, I hope there's no issues with that coming down the line because I've, I've heard some stories of people having some problems and issues with, uh, with it working correctly. Even though something says it's royalty free, I don't know if a algorithm on YouTube is going to interpret the difference correctly or not. God, so much fun. I just love sketching like this. So before we wrap up here, I want to quickly remind you about that quote in the beginning from Milk Call. You know, when I found that, it, it sort of made me smile and made me happy because you realize how hard he had to work to be at the level that he was at and how much you had to try and you know that's i think that's a huge part of being successful at at anything in life and especially at a craft right and a lot of what we're doing with drawing drawing and designing and what part of animation and being a commercial artist is and even being a fine artist at that point it really is about your craft and if it, it's about developing skill sets that are going to make you viable and make you work with you know for for other people so you know that's how it all wraps up so i'm almost done here i wrap up just uh, another minute or two and um before we're done i'm gonna give some credit give a little shout out to uh ben sound okay i think that's good for right now so I'm gonna come back to this and uh, we'll add some whites. So special thank you to Ben Sound. We can get some great royalty-free background, background music, which is what I have in here. Thanks for watching, guys. Take care.